Hello, BookTube. We have this mail haul in the bag. <laughs> this is this is a sign that my I have a, a new UPS driver. Uh, it must be because the, the this just arrived very late in the day and is in a plastic bag because it was pouring rain this morning. And that's probably when this guy thought this this UPS delivery guy thought I'll need it, and it was just riding around in his truck all day as the sun came out for 55 minutes, uh, and, dry, and the day dried up. So we have a, we have a huge plastic bag huh, that we have to get our mail from here. Looks like there are three packages. Uh, so let's see, let's see what we have here. What is this first one? Is it on that? She doesn't know which one to grab. There you go. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, I requested this. Does that have a pub sheet in it, Bean? No? Uh, this is James Donovan. Shoot for the moon. <laughs> this is about Apollo 11. Uh, this is just a new history of Apollo 11. Uh, in time for the 50th anniversary edition. Good lord. That makes some of you feel old. Uh, on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to walk on the moon. A moment forever etched in history. Perhaps the world's greatest technological achievement and a triumph of American spirit and ingenuity. The Apollo 11 mission and the entire Apollo program was a mammoth undertaking involving more than 410,000 men and women who were dedicated to putting a man on the moon and winning the space race with the Soviets. From the shock of Sputnik to that perilous landing at the Sea of Tranquility when the entire world held its breath, this is their story and one of America's greatest sagas. Oh boy. Fantastic. I am always up for a new telling of the Apollo 11 mission. Although, and you know, for most of, the, of those 50 years, I would have agreed completely with that back cover copy. But now I, <laughs> as, as traitors as it feels for an old NASA geek to say this, uh, the moon landing is not the most impressive feat of human technology ever. The internet is. I understand why you would go for the, for the Apollo 11 mission, because the internet has no one creator, and is still creating itself. But nothing has ever been seen. But the Apollo 11 was... It broke ground, yes. Humans walked on another planet, yes. But the technology was uh, an extension of air flight. It was an extension of bathospheres. <laughs> Whereas the internet has morphed into something that has no analog. And that... I, I would put that first, but only by a narrow margin. Then I would go to the moon landing. <laughs> that, feels, that feels right. All right, so this comes out... Uh, uh, this comes out in March. Fantastic. Uh, all right, so what else have we got here in our, in our Santa sack? It's a finished copy of something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. I didn't request this. This comes out in early December. This is Diane Setterfield, who's the author of The Thirteenth Tale that a million book clubs read and loved. I read it and just, it left me completely flat. I thought it was the, just an incredibly boring book. And I've never read anything else by this author. And this is uh, Once Upon a River. That is a swan's neck as a river on the cover. Uh, a little bit strange. <laughs> swan's necks don't really do that. But uh, what have we got here? Well, I, did not, I did not even know this was coming. Isn't that terrible? Uh, a girl floats upstream into the arms of a stranger on the night of the winter solstice, appearing by all medical evidence to be dead. Before the sun rises, she's breathing. This book brings readers a story about the power of storytelling and the ever-changing landscape of family. Uh, set in ancient inns, farms, and manor homes along the 19th century River Thames, Once Upon a River masterfully limbs, L-I-M-N-S limbs as a verb if you don't use it in spoken English, and you don't because nobody does, don't use it in your writing English, it masterfully limbs the urgent scientific curiosity of the Darwinian age with the folklore and mysticism of the backcountry to capture, so that means combines. It's not even used correctly. Not only is it wrong to use the word if you don't use it in spoken English, but it's not even used correctly. It means combine, not, in, not throw light on. Um, Okay, it combines the, the scientific curiosity of the Darwinian age with the folklore and mysticism of the backcountry to capture a place, a people, and a time in one deft swoop. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Okay, so Setterfield's debut, The Thirteenth Tale, was the first debut novel ever to land at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. That can't possibly be true. That can't possibly be true. No, that, that has to mean in modern times, in the 21st century. That can't possibly be the case. What about The Naked and the Dead? I, I, now I want to know. I want to stop the video right now and find out. That can't possibly be the case. That has to be in the 21st century. Now I want to know. All right, well, let's, let's move on here. What else about The Thirteenth Tale? Uh, it's since gone back for 26 printings and been published in 38 countries. That's amazing. Good for her. Incredible. Amazon named it one of the best books of 2006, and in 2013 it was adapted into a TV drama for the BBC. Uh, and now we've got this. Once Upon a River. Fantastic. Okay, well, I, I didn't like uh, The 13th Tale, but I will I will jump right into this thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's right on the horizon, so I can read it right away. Uh, and we'll see. Maybe, maybe uh, this will do it for this author. Fantastic. Uh, and then we'll dig into our Santa sack one last time. It's not a box, but it is cardboard. Let's see what we have here. Uh, one of these vacuum presses. Do you want this one? Do you want some cardboard? <laughs> I haven't yet figured out how long she can go standing on her hind legs like this. I haven't clocked her to see how long. She it appears to be no strain for her at all. So, for all I know, she could stay like that for some time if she felt like she had to. Uh, whereas my Basset Hound was never in that position, even once. <laughs> so it's a very different thing. Uh, but then her Lucy's legs were only her legs were shorter than Frida's, even though she's a much bigger dog, so she probably couldn't. Uh, Okay, this is, uh, looks like a novel. This is, again, I didn't request it, but uh, it's by T.J. Martinson, and it's called The Reign of the Kingfisher. That's the title, and there's a skyline down there. Uh, what is this? In his genre-bending debut novel, oh, a debut, fantastic. Okay, so who is T.J. Martinson when he's at home? He grew up just outside of Chicago. Who didn't? Uh, he received his M.A. in Literary Studies from Eastern Illinois University and is currently working toward a Ph.D. at Indiana University at Bloomington. Oh, so he's, he's a, a grad student. Good Lord, so is this a gripping tale of uh, despair and poverty? <laughs> Let's see. In his genre-bending novel, The Reign of the Kingfisher, novelist T.J. Martinson, well, he's a novelist now. <laughs> Let's not jump the gun. I mean, technically, he doesn't have a novel out yet. So I understand you're trying to pump him up, but you could say writer. <laughs> so, or one, anyway, uh, imagines a tormented, unforgettable hero who will move us all to ask what justice really looks like. The Kingfisher. Chicago used to have a superhero, known to his fans and enemies alike only as the Kingfisher. Some saw him as a savior, who kept the city's drug dealers and thieves off the streets, while others thought he was nothing more than a masked vigilante who, who took things too far. Now he's been dead for more than 30 years, and in those decades, crime has come back to home to roost in the city. One criminal believes the Kingfisher is still alive, and he's willing to add as many bodies to the city's death toll as it takes to prove he's right. The masked gunman captures hostages, and in videos that spread across the city, he promises he'll kill them unless the police admit they faked the Kingfisher's death all those years ago. It falls to three unlikely allies, a disgraced police officer, a retired journalist, and a young hacker, to find the gunman before it's too late. But their investigation seems to open up more questions than answers. Why aren't the police out searching for the hostages? What really happened on that fateful day 30 years ago when the city's hero died? And could the Kingfisher really still be out there, somewhere? Loving this book already. Uh, Martinson has written for uh, a V for Vendetta for our present moment. And the Kingfisher will stand alongside other beloved but troubled heroes from the Watchmen to the Dark Knight. Okay, those are comic books, though. Uh... Uh, after the events in Ferguson, Missouri, and, ensuring, and the ensuing Black Lives Matter movement, Martinson thought a novel about people thinking back, back on and actively searching for a superhero might be an interesting way to reconsider how we define justice and who exactly gets to dispense with, gets to dispense with that justice. I'm pretty sure 
that line was meant to read gets to dispense that justice, not dispense with that justice. They mean completely different things, but uh, but I could be wrong. It'd be an awful subversive way to write it if if it, it, it dispense with is accurate. Uh, okay, so this is a superhero novel about the Kingfisher, who's obviously going to turn out to be still alive at the end of this book, and I'm. I don't know. I'm. I don't know what that Ferguson talk is, and the Black Lives Matter is. Is the Kingfisher black, and the pub sheet just doesn't tell us. Was the original Kingfisher black? Is the mysterious gunman black? Is is race part of this book? They they, they just they don't mention it at all in the pub sheet, except for that mention of Ferguson and Black Lives Matter at the very end. Uh, hmm. Now I'm curious to read it, which is the whole thing. That that means the pub sheet did its job. Uh, so this comes out uh, in March, so it'll be a while before I read it, but uh, but that sounded good, didn't it? That sounded interesting. I, I have almost never read superhero fiction that was done well. I've read a ton of it, and I, I, it's almost always done poorly. So, But then again, it's almost un, always done poorly in the comic books, too, so I can't really, can't really fault the genre. Uh, so we'll see. That's that, that's fantastic. All right. So I, I, this was a three book mail home, which there are two books that I'm not going to read until next year, and one that I'm going to read tonight. So we have uh, the Reign of the Kingfisher, uh, uh, novelist T. J. Martinson's first novel. <laughs> we have we have Shoot for the Moon, James Donovan's history of the Apollo Eleven mission, and we have Once Upon a River uh, by Diane Setterfield. Who a lot of you probably read the Thirteenth Tale and really liked it. it. Didn't do anything for me, uh, but it didn't it didn't fail in a way that would make me say never, never, or that would make me even dislike the name of the author. I, When I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, this is doing everything right. It's just not working. The author's trying to pull off a stage show that you've already seen, and so it's not the novel's fault. In fact, I th if I remember correctly, I, I, I remember reading an advanced copy of it when I worked in a bookstore and thinking, well, this is going to be a hit. I didn't think it was that big of a hit. Uh, but still, this one sounds more up my line, so we, we shall see. I'll read it tonight and report back. <laughs> so so that's our uh, mailbag. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, that's enough out of me. <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap this up, but I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.